Dr. Rhonda Patrick here. When most people think about what raises blood glucose levels, they think about dietary composition or what you eat. And rightfully so. If you eat a meal that consists of highly refined processed sugar lacking a fiber matrix, it will quickly spike your blood glucose levels. However, what most people do not realize is that in addition to what you eat, when you eat is also a very important determinant of your blood glucose levels. Time-restricted eating is a topic I've covered a lot. It refers to eating all your meals within a restricted time period, such as 8 to 12 hours, and then fasting for the remaining 12 to 16 hours. Obviously, time-restricted eating has an intermittent fasting component to it, but it also has a circadian component to it because you try and eat all your meals during a time when your metabolism is optimal. Metabolism changes throughout the day. For example, when healthy adults eat identical meals in terms of both their caloric content and macronutrient content for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, their postprandial glucose levels are the lowest in the morning after breakfast and the highest in the evening after dinner, even though the meals are 100% identical. This may have something to do with melatonin, the hormone that's produced from the pineal gland that plays a role in initiating sleep. If our circadian conditions are optimal, meaning we aren't bathing ourselves in bright blue light before bed, our bodies naturally start to produce melatonin around two to three hours before we go to sleep. Melatonin has been shown to bind to receptors on the pancreas, and this signals to the pancreas to stop producing insulin. That means that our blood glucose levels will remain elevated because glucose is not getting taken up into our cells. I previously had a discussion with the expert on time-restricted eating, Dr. Sachin Panda, and he discussed how melatonin plays a role in blood glucose regulation. So this is where it becomes a little bit complicated because, as you said, there is day and night transition. And uh, we know that in the evening, as our body prepares to sleep, our melatonin level begins to rise. And that melatonin usually rises two to three hours before our habitual sleep time. So uh, if somebody is going to bed around 11, then that melatonin is beginning to rise around nine o'clock. On an average, for some people it might rise around four hours early, and some people it will rise exactly at bedtime. Uh, and when melatonin rises, there is uh, new data showing that melatonin can bind to its receptor in pancreas, and this engagement the melatonin with the pancreas receptor, essentially tells the pancreas, okay, it's time to sleep. Don't, you don't have to bother releasing insulin. Mm -hmm. So in that way, what happens, uh, if somebody is having a big meal when there is high melatonin, then uh, there may not be enough insulin released from pancreas and glucose may stay high in the blood circulation for a long time. And uh, this study, um, these kind of studies came to publication because almost 10 years ago, um, large genome-wide association studies found that people with uh, obesity or diabetes might have a mutation in melatonin receptor. And that was confusing because what is melatonin to do with obesity and diabetes? And you fast forward 10 years, people went back to the drawing board and looked at where the receptor is expressed and what it does when melatonin is engaged, and then they found out that uh, there is this effect of melatonin on insulin. So that's why people who are eating late into the night, they may not get the best benefit in terms of glucose control because that glucose might remain slightly higher than if they had the same dinner two hours earlier. <laughs> This is obviously very relevant for people with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, but it's also important for the general population. For example, one study showed that people with fasting blood glucose levels between high normal and slightly prediabetic may experience more brain atrophy with age. Specifically, they experienced a greater loss in brain volume in the hippocampus and the amygdala, regions of the brain that are involved in learning, memory, and cognition. So elevated blood sugar levels, even in the absence of clinically diagnosable type 2 diabetes, may affect brain health. This really drives home the importance of finishing that last meal or anything else that may drive up your blood sugar levels, like that late night glass of wine, up to three hours before bed to better align with when our bodies are sending signals to shut down insulin production. I'm Dr. Rhonda Patrick, and I'll catch you next time.